Welcome back. Our next conversation is with the First Lady of New York City, Shirlane McRae. Shirlane has redefined the role of First Lady, managing a robust portfolio to advance an ambitious agenda in support of all New Yorkers. Nationally recognized as a powerful champion for mental health reform and dubbed one of Time Magazine's 50 Most Influential People in Healthcare for 2018, Shirlane created Thrive NYC, the most comprehensive mental health plan of any city in the nation. She also spearheads the city's Thrive Coalition with more than 200 mayors, county officials, and thought leaders from all 50 states, advocating for a more integrated and better funded behavioral health system. As chair of the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City, Shalane also brings together government, philanthropy, and the private sector to work on some of the most pressing issues of our time, including mental health, youth employment, and immigration. She also launched and leads the NYC Unity Project, an unprecedented citywide effort to make sure LGBTQ young people in New York City are safe, supported, and healthy. And as co-chair of the Commission on Gender Equity, she is a persistent voice for creating a 50-50 city and world. In partnership with New York City's police chief, she leads the Domestic Violence Task Force. And in 2015, with her signature, New York City became the first city in the country to join the United Nations Women's Safe Cities Global Initiative. Shirlane is a graduate of Wellesley College. She and Mayor Bill de Blasio live in Gracie Mansion, the official residence, and are proud parents of Kiara and Dante. Welcome, Shirlane. It's good to see you again. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really so happy to be here with you. I know. I wish we could do this in person. I'm sorry we have to do it remotely this way, but this is the world we live in today, isn't it? It, it sure is. And I just want to thank you for, for still being out there in any way that you can for sharing your personal story. It means so much to other families who have struggled. And, and I also thank Mental Health America. Um, I recently saw that thousands and thousands, 88,000 more people have reached out through your portal with uh, anxiety and depression during this crisis. And Mental Health America is in such an important lifeline, especially in this moment. Well, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's been amazing to us how many additional people have come into our website and done a mental health screen and how many of them are having such serious issues. I mean, nobody anticipated this six yeah. months ago, but this is the world we're living in now. Yeah. So you were at ground zero for the first weeks of the pandemic. So could you just share with folks what it felt like at that time? Well, let me tell you, um, it, it's very hard to describe the waves of discomfort and distress, fear, anxiety. Um, what has never been more clear is that, that everyone needs more mental health support. Um, it, what, what has never been more clear is that, you know, we are able to, when we have to, adapt uh, to the needs of, of, of people, you know, as, as government. Uh, right now, um, and certainly in the beginning, children uh, were restless and struggling. Parents were losing their jobs. Healthcare workers were traumatized by the, the suffering, so much suffering and, and death. Um, we're in a better place now, uh, but it is not, has not been easy. And it, it has required uh, a lot of resilience, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of looking at things differently. Um, our structures, whether it's healthcare, work, um, and how we get our basic services like, like food. Um, it, it's, I think it's changed our understanding of, of how we live. Tell me just a little bit more about this. I, I want to get into some of the, the sort of policy pieces in a little bit. Um, but just, you know, how we live. How has it been for you and your family? I mean, you're in, a, you're in this fishbowl in addition to having to go through what every other family um, has gone through. How have you done the last few months? <laughs> well, I, I, I think I went from from relief from the, you know, and not having to do the, the regular schedule because, you know, a lot of what 
what I do, what my husband does, we, we do events. Um, and, and there was for me, I have to admit, a certain amount of, of relief uh, the, from that. But then it was um, all about how can we help our people, right? It was figuring out how to adapt, how to, how to figure out um, you know, people's food needs, distribution of PPE, so many, um, so many different difficulties to address. Uh, education centers for our children. Uh, you know, it's a long list uh, and the work continues. Um, right now we're trying to open up our schools, but it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's, it's a challenge like no other because there are so many layers uh, to the way that we live that have been threatened or challenged by this virus. Yeah, it seems like those layers have really just disrupted everybody and, and really has undermined, you know, the mental health of, of everybody in the nation from our perspective. I mean, going into this, you know, we used to say, well, half of Americans are going to experience mental health challenges during the course of their lifetime. But um, it's like all Americans, you know, all people in the world have been experiencing these challenges all at once, it seems, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, um, again, it's never been more clear that everyone needs mental health support, that, that, that we need um, to have mental health in all of our policies. Um, we made a very quick switch from, from you know, life as normal, you know, regular life to all of a sudden we have telemedicine and working from home. And, and you know, I'm just grateful that in New York, we have um, we had some experience of, of working uh, across sectors. We had Thrive. We have these 30 programs across a dozen agencies and, and community-based organizations as well, which, which helped us. It helped us um, to have social-emotional learning already in place because we had launched it last year to help our children identify their emotions and be able to learn how to manage them. They got a lot of practice during this difficult time. Um, and I can't stress um, how much we have recognized that having uh, mental health programs across all of these agencies, whether it's the you know, Department of Health or parks or schools, police, uh, has, has made a difference here in New York City and how we handled this crisis. I mean, we were ready to help our healthcare workers who are traumatized uh, because of the burnout you know, the suffering, the death. We were ready to help them. Of course, we needed more help, but we, we at least had structures in place to give people the kinds of attention that they needed. And not everyone had that. So yes, we were hit really hard by the virus. But I think that we, we were lucky uh, or, or privileged in that we did have uh, some structures in place. That, that's one of the things that I think um, you know, people don't understand well enough, I think outside of the, what I'll call the policy arena or even the political arena that, you know, I, I was a mayor, you know, it, a, a long time ago, but I was a mayor and, and knew how important it was to prepare um, for, for things that might come. And, and I think that you um, have just done a remarkable job and your husband has as mayor, I think over the past few years anticipating not that we would have this pandemic, um, but anticipating that kids were going to need additional support anyway, that, that public employees, essential workers would need additional support anyway, that the mm -hmm. population would need additional support anyway. So, you know, it, it's, you, you get a lot of credit in, in my book, and, and maybe not everybody would see that, but I think those of us who've been on that side um, really can see just how important all of what you had done leading into this year was in making a difference in getting control over um, as much of this pandemic as anybody could get control over and, uh, and really helping people see, you know, that there's, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> so let, let's just turn our attention a bit to New York City itself. I mean, it has always been an amazingly multi multicultural city. And in its diversity today, it looks a lot like most of the nation's going to look a generation from now. 
-hmm. So maybe people don't even realize that today more than half the population is non-white. And even though you've got great teaching hospitals there and all kinds of assets, the non-white populations haven't always had the same access to neighborhood healthcare services and other supportive services as others. And communities with the highest mental health needs may be the least likely to be able to access mental health resources during and after the pandemic. So putting on your, your hat as chair of the Task Force on Racial Inclusion and Equity, can you talk about the approaches you're taking in New York City to uh, tackle some of these issues, particularly the lack of mental health care, but in general, uh, these issues in disenfranchised communities and maybe help others who are thinking about doing this uh, get their heads on straight? Yes, well, a a as you said, um, structural racism um, has become ever more evident um, during this crisis. Um, people who have already been in some kind of, um, people who have been disenfranchised, people who have um, struggled to, to have access to good jobs, good education, um, good health care, um, have been put in an even uh, more, more difficult position. And, and when you think about it, well, when you think about it yourself, like what would trigger a mental health crisis in your own life? A sick parent, loss of employment, um, inability to pay your bills, isolation, all of those things, you know, would hit very hard. And they're all happening at the same time for so many people in our, our, our uh, communities of color. I met with a, a church leader not long after the beginning of the crisis who had lost 30 people in her congregation. And on top of the loss of life, you know, again, hundreds of thousands of people have, have lost jobs and, and our seniors and young people are, are really, really struggling. Um, I think for, for us, um, for the task force, and we've got 65, 70 members of the task force, mostly people of color who were born in or come from or have lived and worked in all of these communities, 27 hardest hit communities, um, that it's, it's, it's been an opportunity uh, to give back in a way, um, in a very focused way that we haven't had before. First of all, um, getting to know each other, um, because in a, in a big place like New York City, it's not a given that every person of color in a senior position at agency knows each other. Um, and putting our brains together like what, to figure out what can we do for our communities. Uh, and we've, we've um, had some infrastructure with NYC Well, our, our 24 seven helpline, with social emotional learning, with NYC Care, which we started last year, which is um, healthcare for everyone, even our undocumented. Um, we, what we were able to do is build on all of those things to make sure that not only that these services were available, but that people are actually connecting to them. It's one thing to provide a service, it's another thing to make sure people are actually connecting. That's a different job. Um, so we expanded NYC Care, uh, again, which we had started, but we hadn't expanded to all of these communities yet. So we can make sure that everyone has access to a primary care provider. And, and that it means that they will also have care to specialty care. They'll have mental health care. Uh, we are building on Thrive and making sure that we have get trainers into these neighborhoods to make sure that, um, that people get uh, mental health first aid training, um, that people have uh, access to uh, workshops uh, to help them overcome their trauma. We want people to have uh, skills that actually, or training I should say, that stays in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's why we're, we're sending trainers to train other trainers so that these, these people will help strengthen their own communities so that people can help themselves. But I have to say that some of the biggest hurdles have been uh, in terms of uh, things like broadband. Um, you know, we're not a rural, we don't have a rural community. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We're not talking about rural communities, but we have hundreds of thousands of people who don't have broadband. Like imagine what it means to not have internet service in 2020 and during a pandemic when people uh, can't um, go out uh, necessarily to, to get the care they need. So that's something that we are working on. We're providing broadband to 
like thousands of, of, of people for the first time. And, um, and we're working on the barriers that have prevented that from happening uh, before now. It's a lot to do. It really is. But I, I know that by the end of this pandemic, we're actually going to be in a stronger place. These communities are going to be in a stronger, better place because of the focus that we've been able to uh, to put on these communities and not just, you know, like making sure they have food and and making sure they have devices for remote uh, learning and all of those things, but also so that they have um, uh, job training, skill training, that they have tools that to be that they can strength help continue to strengthen their own communities. I think that's one of the things that um, we sometimes, you know, forget. We we think that strengthening people is simply about strengthening their health or strengthening their uh, financial circumstances or you know, strengthening the neighborhood that they live in. And we forget it's about strengthening everything. It's about strengthening the entire environment. And, you know, we didn't get where we've gotten to overnight. And, you know, I think some people are hoping for the, you know, the, the magical answer out there that, you know, the miracle that's going to happen where overnight, you know, everything changes and, and everything is just, just rosy you've got to be investing in all of this stuff. And I know that for a lot of people um, around the country, that's sometimes challenging to think, well, how do we do that? You know, we have limited resources. We've got, you know, whatever, you know, we've got excuses. We've got limited resources, but, but no limit to the excuses that we've got. And I think that, you know, one of the most important things you've done as a model is just pull the resources together that are there and then try to use those to, to build additional resources that, as you say, will remain in communities, will remain in neighborhoods, and will strengthen all the people living there. That, that's not really the kind of uh, picture that's kind of painted often in more progressive areas. Um, but in fact, that's the reality of what some of the most progressive areas are doing. Uh, wouldn't you agree? I agree 100%. Uh, for example, with our task force, we are not necessarily pouring uh, a lot of new resources into uh, these programs or services. We're using existing, uh, our existing agency funding, we're using existing resources, but we're using them in a different way. We're looking at like, well, how are we using this money? Why is it going here rather than there? Um, and, and, and some areas that's, you know, it's a, it's a thinking very differently and some areas it's thinking creatively. Um, there is really, you know, I, I, I look at us and we're the richest city in, in the country, right? We have so many resources. Why isn't it possible for us to change this, this paradigm that we're in? Um, and it, it really does come down to, um, comes down to just saying what our priorities are, changing our priorities. Uh, change is possible. I, I feel like this pandemic has in many ways flipped a switch. Um, that we have seen that, that so many of the things that um, we thought, oh, just couldn't work or weren't possible, um, are all of a sudden we're using. And I think you know, telemedicine is a great example of that. Um, people have kind of fought against that for many years and look how, how we're using it um, so fluidly right now. Look at uh, working from home, uh, re look at remote schooling. You know, these things may not be ideal, but look how possible they are. And, I, and look at even our in, in terms of like, the protests and the culture, our cultural and social life. I look at, you know, our, our newspaper, for example, you look at the New York Times, where if you look at the paper to you know these last few weeks and you look at the paper a year ago uh, you'll notice that there are black people in almost every section of the paper now which is not and it's not tokenism it's, it's like black people all of a sudden I and mean, people of color have a significant and consistent and contributing uh, part in this world and it it makes me angry because it just shows how how easy it was to do. I mean, that it could just happen like that in the, in the course of a few months. Um, and, but it also makes me angry because I know that we could do so much more 
if people just thought a little differently, right? If people just, just didn't accept the conventional way of doing things and say, you know, we're going to make this happen and we're just going to all put our heads together and find a way to do it. It can happen. Why does it always take so much pain? I, it's a tremendous pain to make change. I feel like um, the pandemic, I mean, there's not a lot of good things that have come out of the pandemic, but there are some good things. And, you know, I, in terms of how, how we look at each other um, and the things I mentioned earlier, telemedicine, remote learning, all of that is like showing us what is possible, but it has taken great pain for us to get there. Yeah, and, and I'm with you. I, I, I agree I, so, with, completely with, with all of what you've said. I mean, honestly, th this is easy, right? This, this was easy in many respects to, to make this transition that we've seen. And yet, you know, it has taken so much pain from so many people for so many decades and generations to get there. And the worry I have is that, you know, it, the, the ease of these transitions, in a sense, become almost for some people the, the tokenism, right? We're, we're now, because we elected a black president, we now live in a post-racial, you know, society. Well, right. We right, no, we didn't. But it's like, we, we ticked that box for some people and it's okay, now we took that box. So now you see all of these additional, you know, people and stories and narratives and perspectives elevated uh, into say the New York Times. But, you know, I don't see them yet in the New York Post, you know, so w when do we, I get to say that you don't by the way. And, uh, but you know, but when do we, you know, when do we just say, you know, it's, it's, it's not enough, right? The, it, the, the pain has been too much, but we've got to continue to push people forward. You know, we can't, we can't rest and relax. I think sometimes, you know, that happened after the, the, the horrible times we went through in the 1960s that, you know, we got to the 80s, right? And, and we went through eight big years of nationally resting and relaxing, feeling like we had, you know, we, we did all that, right? We, we got through all that. Now it's time to you know, invest in the, in, 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 in the economy again and to, to do all that. And it, it just, you know, it feels like, you know, I, I want this to be a more solid foundation, I think, is what I'm getting at. I, I, I agree with where, what you've said and where you're coming from and all this, but don't you just hope this is the one, this is the moment, this is the time. It's, it's finally here and we're going to be able to build on this one and not have somebody else just come along and tear it down again. Well, I think that, you know, when we do go through times like this, that, that there is, there's change that cannot be completely wiped out. Um, and, and unfortunately, we do seem to take a few steps backward every time. Um, but I, I do believe that this is a great big leap forward and that this is a time of, of great reckoning. Um, I think that with the, the protest, the economic distress, the, the, the health crisis, everything that we're going through right now is going to uh, lead to a generation of, of adults, of generation, because the young adults going through this now are going to be shaping uh, the future of this country. Um, I think it is going to change the way things are done. I know that um, people are having uncomfortable conversations. They're asking tough questions. They're they are thinking about what they value. Um, and and, and I, I think this is especially true of our young people because they are in what I call the great pause. They, they are thinking about, oh my God, they're not thinking necessarily about, well, how can I start my career? They're thinking like, what kind of work can I do? How can I make money? How can I meet people? How can I go on a date? How can I um, leave, make my mark on the world? What, what do I believe in? with everything that I'm witnessing right now. Remember, many of them have never had this kind of experience. They have not seen a, a George Floyd, right, incident. There has not been that in their life. They haven't been through um, necessarily great economic distress as we are going through right now, uh, or beginning to go through, depending on where people are sitting. They, we're, um, we're revealing history that has not been revealed before. Um, 
I think that that we won't go back. We won't go backwards completely. Um, that this is a, a a chance that we have to make a giant leap forward, and it, it remains to be seen uh, what we will take from it. But I I, ha I have hope. I really do. I have hope that that we will take a lot from this experience and and to make this a, a better world. Well, I hope people are are listening to you because um, I, I think you you know you're showing people a way forward, and you know in the work that you're doing and in your own dedication to it, um, you know that you're deriving hope from from these circumstances. I think it's just really important because. I do think a lot of people are feeling lost and they need to see people, you know, like you who are saying, you know, okay, I've lived through this, you know, and my community's coming through it. We've got a lot of work to do and, you know, we don't have perfect systems and a perfect society yet, but um, look what's happening. Look at all the positive things that are happening. So I, I know you've said you derive hope from, the energy, the enthusiasm, the, the young people who are, I think, challenging conventional ways of, of thinking. Uh, any other kind of last words uh, for them or for the other people who are watching about how we hold on to our hope these days? <laughs> well, Paul, we're still here. <laughs> okay. Right? On all <laughs> people who are listening, we're still here, right? Oh, yeah. And I hope we're, we're, we're all still fighting. I'm fighting. Uh, we've lost so many people in our communities, and you know, I I, I think about that that minister I, who I talked to had lost three people. Um, we've lost heroes like John Lewis, um, who I was very pleased to have an opportunity to meet and talk with just a few months ago. Um, there's a champion if you ever saw one. Um, he never stopped fighting. We can never stop fighting. We have to be. Um, inspired for those who are looking at us, people who are watching us, um, we have to inspire others. So I, I, I hope people will get out there and vote, um, vote for people who will uh, be champions for us going forward. I hope people are filling out the census. Um, that is very important. I hope people will continue protesting and, and get into good trouble, good positive trouble by, you know, by, by challenging the status quo. That Sounds is, like something you might have told your kids at some point. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You, you know, they know um, that in my lifetime, I've experienced a lot of pain and a lot of change with civil rights, with the Black Power Movement, feminism, gay rights, AIDS, the opioid epidemic, and whatever else. I, I, you know, it's that and right now, this is a great reckoning that with racism and social injustice and mental health reform, health reform, we're going through a rebirth and rebirth is is never easy we have to keep at it look at the conversations we're having uh, keep protesting and 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 really invest in our young people uh, who will be leading the way uh, who are leading the way already in many cases and we can do this we got to right. well Keep hope alive. <laughs> yes keep hope alive and keep fighting Charlene and I'm going to keep fighting on your team so okay. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Paul. And next up, we will hear from MHA's Executive Vice President, Mary Gilliberti, and Rebecca Coakley, Director of the Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Mary?